Jeffrey O'Brien is a partner at Cameron and Chestnut, right? Is that how you say Chestnut it? Cameron. Chestnut Cameron. Sorry, I don't have my notes. I'm going to give him the short intro. I'm going to turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry I'm, I'm late. I'm a very demanding, needy client right now. He's still calling for revisions on the contract, so it's just great. Okay, we're going to talk about the future of Minnesota's craft beer and liquor industry. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the legal issues that go into having a craft brewery. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of some of the legislative changes that have happened over the past several years, which has really fueled the boom in our craft brewery industry. And then some predictions on my part as to what might be coming in the future. And of course, we'll talk about the question that everybody wants to know about. Are we, is our market saturated? Okay. I know that lawyers like charts and graphs and figures. So this is my completely scientifically researched chart. Um, you'll see that the, the growth of Minnesota's brewing and distilling industry is in direct proportion to the number of outdated prohibition era laws that have been repealed. Um, I, I say that only partly tongue in cheek. It really is the case. Um, if you look at the statistics, now if you remember 2011 was when, the, when we had adopted the, what they called the Surly Law or the Taproom Law, which allowed for, a, for the first time for a production brewery to have to be able to sell its products on premise for on sale consumption. Before that, the only way you could do that was to have a brew pub, which leads to a whole bunch of other um, restrictions in terms of distribution. So it's not the brew pub is not really the, a, a great model in Minnesota because of the, of the yeah. Uh, your question about the graph and the 2016 number. Yeah. Is, is that accurate? 166 or is that going to be a drop? Uh, in terms of the production? Yes. Um, what should it be? What is that supposed to be? 266. You know, here's the deal. I think in the, as I understand from some of my clients, and I, I should, I'll mention that here. Look at the, the, the number of breweries you see going, ticking upward. The production numbers, they aren't required to, re, to report production to the state. So I think they've been deliberately not, some of them have stopped reporting. Um, and I don't know why, but I, one of my clients told me this. We don't, we no longer, we don't, we aren't required to, so we don't report it. I'm like, well, okay, that doesn't really help our arguments for future legislative changes if you guys stop reporting the data. But anyway, <laughs> but you'll see that you look if you look at the number of breweries, you see that it's grown steadily since 2011 when they passed the uh, the taproom law. And you know what the taproom law does is so you if you go, if you have a production brewery that is primarily engaged in producing beer, sending it out for in kegs, in you know bottles, cans, being sold at liquor stores, at other bars and restaurants, and what they allow to be able to do is that now they can they can put taps on and they can sell their product. Before they could give samples, but they couldn't sell pints and flights at the tap room. Um, that's what really has has opened the floodgates. There have been a number of small breweries that have cropped up that have just wanted to be the tap room only. The most famous one of that, I think, is is one of my clients, Dangerous Man in Northeast Minneapolis. Their entire business model is based on getting beer at their location. Um, you can either, either have a pint or a flight at, at, the, at the tap room or go next door to their bottle shop and buy growlers or 750 milliliter bottles, but they don't, or crawlers too now. They don't sell, they don't distribute to liquor stores. They don't distribute to any of the bars and restaurants. And I'll explain, we'll talk later about our distribution laws and I'll explain why so many, why the tap, why the tap room only model is so favorable at this time. But so it, bottom line is the tap room law exploded the marketplace. At, at the same time, it also exploded the marketplace for distilleries. Relatively speaking, we went from zero to, you know, now we're up approaching 30 this year. The same law that in, that ushered in the tap room also cut the, the license fee for a micro distillery. Before there was just a distillery was the only thing in, in the law. The, the same legislation that brought in the tap room law also created this thing called a micro distillery with a much lower permitting fee. Previously, to, get a, to start a distillery in Minnesota, it was $30,000 for the license. Once, they, once this law was passed, creating a micro distillery license, it was $1,000. So that's why you see, uh, you know, Tattersall and Eleven Wells and all these other dis, uh, distilleries popping up is because it's a heck of a lot more affordable. There's a distillery over in Wisconsin called 45th Parallel. Those guys are from Minnesota. They would have opened here had that micro distillery law passed at the time they were opening. But they didn't. They didn't want to pay $30,000. So they ended up across the border in Wisconsin.
So they're kind of tied together, the growth of these two industries off of that one, that 2011 uh, legislation. And the legislative changes, there have been uh, further legislative changes and it continues to affect industry growth. So, um, you know, a lot of our laws have been based, still go back to prohibition. And if you get a little history lesson here, um, you know, remember when, when prohibition was repealed or going to be repealed, there weren't enough votes in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate, for a clean repeal. So they had attached, in order to get enough votes, the compromise was, okay, we're going to repeal the, the 18th Amendment and, and, and get rid of prohibition, but we're going to... Um, we're, we're going to let states regulate their alcohol industries. And so every single state is a little bit different. There's some, some things that are the same, but everything goes back to that whole coming out of prohibition. Remember under prohibition, you know, alcohol was bad and the people that made alcohol was bad, were bad. And with, we approach it from a public safety standpoint, we need to protect the public from, you know, alcohol and their manufacturers. Otherwise they're going to have everybody addicted. So for a lot, for decades, we have operated, in my opinion, under a more of a public safety model in terms of regulating alcohol production, particularly in Minnesota. That's part of the reason why in our state you find the, uh, you know, the, the, the alcohol regulatory authority under the Department of Public Safety. AGE is under Department of Public Safety. And I think that with the, with the advent of the, the, you know, the craft brewery movement, particularly the tap room law coming out at a time when you were still, we're still kind of muddling out of a recession. I think we're looking at these businesses still from a public safety standpoint, but I think even we're evolving to looking at these more as small local businesses that provide economic development, that provide jobs, that provide tax revenue. And I think that's part of what's driving this willingness on the part of lawmakers to look at further reforms to see can we can we continue to can we can we grow this industry now we're getting to the point we're trying to figure out i think where can we can we grow this industry but not at the expense of the other the other tiers the retailers and the wholesalers so that's going to be i think the push pull coming in the future think about that as we go through these changes we're you know we're, how we're we, we're tracking through it's really coming back to we didn't these book these laws were on the books for a long long time before they started getting changed so this is my cynical uh, take on how a liquor bill becomes law. You know, we all remember from Schoolhouse Rock, you know, I'm just a bill and how, you know, how in theory, the, the clean way that bills become laws. But some of you probably know, have intimate knowledge of how some of these laws are made over here. But ultimately, when a, when a law is proposed over at the Capitol related to liquor, usually the, 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 the lawmakers want to know, okay, if, if the if the brewers propose the law or the distillers propose the law, they want to know well where do the wholesalers sit, where do the retailers sit, or and, and vice versa. They all want to they, they you know they they want to know where of the three tiers where all of them stand before they they do something. Um, and they try they try not to upset the apple cart too much in favor of any one. I'm biased right now. I I think that it's still. The, the laws are most restrictive on the manufacturing tier. And that could just be as a result of the fact that for a long, long time, we really didn't have a vibrant manufacturing tier. We had wholesalers and we had retailers. We only had a hand, you know, for a long time, we only had a handful of breweries. Now we're dealing with, you know, we've got 200 some app, you know, licensees. So in the past five years, the legislature has taken what I think are important, important incremental steps in modifying the state's liquor laws. I mentioned before in 2011, um, the legislature passed the Surly Bill. Um, that enables breweries that produce fewer than 250,000 barrels a year to serve pints of beer on site. Now this is instructive as to, again, how our liquor laws are made. Why 250,000 barrels a year? Which is, a barrel is roughly, it's like 31, it's like, uh, 31 gallons. The reason that they, they, they went for the high number, it basically allows everybody Summit on down, Shell's, Surly, to have a tap room. But let's say that AB InBev, the parent company of Budweiser, purchased a, one of our local breweries. The way the, the statute is worded is they could not continue to operate a tap room. So the, the tap room law is worded in a way to keep uh, AB InBev, Miller, the big breweries from ever having able to have a tap room in Minnesota. Other states are not like that, but Minnesota is. Um, 
you go back to now 2013, I mentioned before in 2011, we had the micro distillery uh, license as well. 2013, um, the micro distilleries were then being able to provide samples to customers that took tours of the micro of their distillery. That was new. Before you could go to a, if you could go to a distillery, they couldn't legally even give you a sample. So the distilleries, in some in some respects, have kind of ridden on the coattails of the brewers, the breweries, in terms of the reforms they get. A lot of times, the brewers knock the door down, get the reform, and then the distillery says, "Well, they get it. How come we can't have?" And so then, so that's been the last couple of years. You've been seeing this kind of uh, shadow. The distillers have been kind of following in the shadow of the of the breweries. Um, small licensed brewers are able to get the off sale brewers license, so they can um, they, they can get uh, they have the, the growler law. Um, Twenty fourteen tap rooms can offer beer for on sale on Sundays if they receive municipal authorization. If you guys remember, this was a huge issue a couple of years ago. Um, this this one fell out of the, the the constant wrangling over allowing Sunday liquor sales, and this and it was a couple, back in 2014. The the compromise proposal was, well, we can have the the tap rooms could um, could have uh, could could be on do on sale on Sundays. In the, the previous session, it came up, and it and the, it was, I think it was the, the the Teamsters that objected to it, saying that if if the if they were if the that the tap, if the breweries were allowed to have their tap rooms open for on sale on Sundays, somehow it was going to force a reopening of their contracts with the wholesalers, and so it was killed. Then it was killed that session, the previous session, because of that. In 2014, suddenly they had an epiphany, and we never even saw the contracts, but they suddenly were okay with it the next year. So I don't know what 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 the what changed their mind between one session to the next, but they were okay with it in 2014, so they passed it. So that was the so the tap rooms now were allowed to do on sale on Sunday. Previously, they could not be they could they could not be open. Um, they can also refill uh, any growler, uh, in, including growlers from other breweries. Now this is one of these things. I always talk when I talk to my law clerks or other or law students or whoever about. Um, we all remember our classes on statutory interpretation, and I say, remember how we were taught? You're taught that it, with with laws that if it doesn't say that you can't do it, that means that you can do it. So the liquor law is the complete opposite. If it doesn't explicitly say that you can do something, that it means you can't do something. And part of our job as as lawyers is to figure out how far we can how far we can go with AGE to get them to, to say, okay, this is permitted under the statute. And we actually, there's a handful of us in different firms that get together now once a month that we rotate at different clients' tap rooms and trade notes. Okay, what did they tell you? What did they tell you? Let's, let's make a kind of compile a body of law here based on letters and emails and everything else to kind of get, and it all of course could change with, you know, a change in, in who the director of AGE is. Um, so there was, what is one of the gaps? There's nothing was said in the statutes about whether or not a one brewery A could take, if someone brought, you know, does everybody know what a growler is? Okay, so if if brewery A could, if a customer came in with a, a growler from brewery B, if customer A, if brewery A was legally allowed to fill it. So they actually had to put that in the statute that said they have the option of doing it. Um, and then also in 2014 was the micro distilleries again, on the heels of the of the breweries, breweries got their tap rooms. Distilleries wanted cocktail rooms, so now the distillery micro distilleries can uh, they can do on sale if they have a, a cocktail room license. Um, and it's the uh, well, we'll get the off sale in a minute here. Uh, recently, okay, so 2015, this was the off sale. The breweries and brew pubs are allowed to sell growlers off sale on Sundays provided they have local approval. The reason they put all these in about the, the, the deferring to the municipality or local approval is generally speaking for the, for the is a compromise with the uh, municipal liquor store uh, communities if they don't want to authorize the, the, the off sale on a, on, a, on a Sunday, they had the option not to even create the, create the, li the, uh, the license for it. Oh, and in the micro distilleries, they're not allowed to do off sale as well. One 375 milliliter souvenir bottle of their product per day, so long as it's a product that they make available to all the wholesalers. So again, the wholesalers still are, if you, they, they are still hold a lot of sway, especially in the distillery realm. 
And so it, I can tell you when it comes down to, you know, holiday gift giving time for staff, it's a pain in the butt having to go back multiple times to your client to buy 375 milliliter souvenir bottles of different liqueurs and stuff because you, because the law doesn't allow you to do otherwise. So anyway, um, but it's better than it's more, it's less restrictive than some other States. I think North Carolina actually says you can, they can sell one 375 milliliter bottle per customer per year. I have no idea how you would track that, that you were in here last week. You can't have, we can't sell you. I don't think like, you know, have like a finger, a thumbprint or something. I don't know. But anyway, and this is, this is one that they continue, the distilleries continue to push on um, and the wholesalers continue to push back on. They really want to sell 750 milliliter bottles, which is what you typically would see in a liquor store uh, of their product and be able to do some like souvenir stuff with the, you know, little gift packs and stuff like that, but like kind of exclusive to the distillery, but right now they can't. Um, there was no omnibus liquor bill passed during the 2016 legislative session. Um, the reason is that the, this was, this is all tracking with the Sunday sales legislation. A lot of the reforms that we've had on liquor law that have benefited the breweries and the distilleries really have been because Sunday sales was sitting up there at the Capitol every year. And so this was the compromise of you guys, we'll give you this, we'll give you this. And you guys shut up about Sunday sales. And the thing is, every year we'd come, someone else would come back and bring up Sunday sales. So we're going in 2016. You had, a, you, had a, you had an election year where both the House and Senate were up for re-election. You had a lot of commentary uh, from the media, from activist groups, from all over the, from the, you know, the, the beer buying public, liquor buying public, about why in the heck do we still not, I can't, we still not buy alcohol on Sundays uh, from, a, from a liquor store. And so the, so there was a, the, the House tried to, to, to vote on the bill. There were the, Tom Bach had said, no omnibus liquor bills, period, end of story. I do not want my members on record as to whether or not they support or oppose Sunday sales. Because obviously, you know, time, he was at the time that, you know, you got the, the Teamsters and this, everybody's got their own special interests on every side of this issue. So he didn't want to have to have the members on record as to the, the Sunday sales issue. Speaker Dowd decided to try to force the issue. And it, I was told that they had by, by a friend that they had the votes at, when they went to the floor with it, which is they said they were only going to bring it up if they had the, if they had the votes for it. The wholesalers, the retailers did a really good job of turning seven Republicans in safe seats from yes to no uh, in, since the previous year's vote. So that's how it ended up failed in 2016. So as a result, there was no uh, liquor law changes in, in 2016. So we get to this year. Now, of course, we, we all know we got Sunday sales. You can now go buy you know, beer, wine, or booze from a liquor store on Sundays. Which is, in my opinion, great. You know, it's been, I've, I've taken advantage of it several times, particularly during Vikings football games. Um, but the problem was that there was another, there was a whole omnibus liquor bill, separate and aside from the Sunday sales issue that was proposed, and everything was stripped out of it and then tabled. Um, the distilleries wanted to have their cocktail rooms open on Sundays, just like the breweries have their tap rooms open. They still can't do that. A number of the breweries pushed for um, increasing the growler limits. What do I mean by that? Well, they not only do they want the right now, if you're above 20,000 barrels, you can no longer sell growlers. So some of the breweries like Fulton and Surly, um, they no longer can legally sell growlers because they're over the 20,000 limit. Um, they also wanted to increase the, the vessel sizes. So more than, you know, 64 ounce or the 750 milliliter bottle. Um, because of the, the, the retailers and the wholesalers were you know, vehemently opposed, as you, as you know, to the Sunday sales bill. There was some in the, in the, in the, in the house that said, enough is enough. We, we've pushed the retailers too far this year. We don't want to, we're not going to do it anymore. So they stripped out these the provisions in, in, the, uh, in the, the, the liquor bill and the omnibus bill and uh, Joe Hoppy tabled it um, as, after that. The one thing that did get through, I think through the tax bill, they did get the one, the one provision that survived the omnibus bill was keeping the bars open 
Super Bowl weekend until 4 a.m. That was going to that was in the bill too. That was tabled, and they like I said they they, I, they found some justification to sneak it in through the through the tax bill. But other than that, there were no other there were no other reforms passed um, in the session besides Sunday sales. The other one that went down, I had a client of mine that was pro, that had pushing it. And my client is Ben Brewstillery. They do both beer and uh, spirits. And so that's why they get the you know, brew distillery because they do breweries for like a brewery and a distillery. They are allowed to make both and sell them both off sale, but they have to make a choice one or the other if they want to have a tap room or a cocktail room. They can't serve um, they can't serve their spirits in their tap room if they're if they're going to sell beer there. Uh, that's you know obviously the retailers are concerned about it being more like a bar, but also the um, the distil other distilleries that are up and running are opposed to it because they look at it as it took us a, it's a lot of money and a lot of time to get up and running and it's easier to open a brewery. And if we allow, if, if it's allowed to have someone to sell both in their tap room, all they're going to do is they're going to start a brewery. And as soon, once their whiskey is ready, they're going to flip to a distillery. They shouldn't be able to do that because we didn't have to do that. Or we weren't allowed to do that. So we don't want it. And so that bill, that bill didn't even get, I don't even got introduced because the, the proposed sponsor said, I'm not bringing it unless I hear from the distillers guild. So um, they didn't they didn't bring that one up. Um, further legislative efforts, um, I think we're going to see probably revisit those growler laws, particularly the the limit of the twenty thousand. Um, the I think we're going to see more of the distilleries and now the cideries seeking parity with breweries um, in terms of the hours of operation for cocktail rooms, self distribution. Um, the breweries can self distribute so long as they're under 20,000 barrels, meaning that they don't have to go through a wholesaler. And I'll explain in a minute the implications of that. The distilleries are required to go through a, a wholesaler. Um, the, the diff, the, they can have a fixed term for their contract, but they have to sign up with somebody like a Johnson Brothers or Southern Wine Spirits or Vinicopia. With well, a cideries, or you know, a cider is, is legally considered wine, so it's governed by what the rules are for wineries. And a winery, whether or not they can self-distribute, depends on where they're located. Um, if you're on a, if you're a farm winery, you can self-distribute. If you are a non-farm winery, and one of my clients, Urban Forge, just opened up their tap room on uh, Lake Street, Minneapolis. If you're an, if you're a non-farm winery, you have to sign up through a, a distributor. You can do the you can have your tape your 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 kind of your tap room and sell your you know sell uh, glasses of your product and you can sell bottles on site for off sale consumption but in terms of getting into liquor stores you have to sign up with a wholesaler to do that if you're a non farm winery but a lot, and so i think we're going to see we're seeing now i think we're going to see more um, cideries real cideries open in the twin cities so the, the 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 appeal of cider is of course that it's gluten free um, Sociable Cider Works, which makes a great product, is doing it under a brewer's license. It's, they're using sorghum as a malt substitute uh, with approval of the state. So it isn't cider in the legal sense that you think, that you, that you think about it compared to like if you would go to um, uh, the number 12 Cider House, which is a, a farm winery out in Buffalo. Theirs is what the, you know, what the, what the legal definition of cider is. Sociable calls it cider because they're 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 using apple juice to start with, but it is they do have a malt a malt uh, substitute in there to make it a malted beverage so that they can take advantage of the more favorable laws for breweries in the Twin Cities, such as being able to self distribute, um, you know, growlers, all that kind of stuff. Um, what we also might see um, the wholesalers may push back on tap room growth or curtail sales of distribution rights. One of the things that happens, um, there's been breweries that have been selling their distribution rights. You know, when a, when a, when a wholesaler sells out to another wholesaler, the brands that the, that the selling wholesaler ca carry distributes are assets that go along in the sale. And with some very narrow exceptions, it's hard for a brewery to opt out of their distribution relationship at that point because of the sale. So someone had the idea, well, if the distributors can sell our distribution rates, why can't we sell our distribution rates when we're, we're you know, below that 20,000 threshold where we don't have to, where we could opt to distribute ourselves. So there've been a number of, of those sales happening. The, I know in Texas, the wholesalers brought a loss or, or for, 
prompted the legislature to prohibit such sales and there's been a lawsuit. I think it's been overturned. Um, wholesalers have also made noise about curtailing the growth of the tap rooms. This has been at a national forum. They, they, they brought that up about whether or not they're, they're giving the, the, the brewers too many rights. There was actually a very controversial memo that circulated amongst the Wisconsin Assembly about the, an idea of making breweries buy, buy their beer back from the wholesalers to serve at their tap rooms in order to put the, re, the bars on an even playing field with them because the breweries could charge less for the beer. Uh -huh. That died. That didn't even get introduced. But, the, but it, it didn't even, it wasn't even written into a bill, but it was just, it, it, the, it, you know, it was the, the mem the, this memo that circulated is what caused all the, the problem. In my opinion, the biggest fight coming is the beer franchise laws. Now, when I'm talking about beer franchise laws, I'm talking about the, 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 contra the laws that govern the contracts between brewers and wholesalers. Now, I always refer to this picture, I include it in all my presentations, I refer to this as the original wholesalers. You gotta get an impression of how, how, how warmly I feel about them. Um, this is a very, this is a ver very pro-wholesaler statute, and there's historical reason for it. Um, 325B was written, it was, was, it was uh, passed in 1977. This is coming out of an era where you had a lot of small local breweries consolidating into larger breweries and wholesalers being small and local. And so the potential was there and there was, there was proof of it of large breweries such as Budweiser or Anheuser-Busch at the time being able to kind of dictate terms to small wholesalers or we're, going to, or we're going to be gone. So the legislature made it difficult for that to happen, made it difficult for a brewery to simply pull away from the, from a distributor. And, but they also, there's some, there's, but as in this era now with, with craft breweries, they've also, now it's, it's, not only is this law a sword or a shield vis-a-vis -vis small wholesaler and large brewery, but it becomes a sword vis-a-vis -vis these wholesalers that have now consolidated and are much larger than these very small breweries. So some highlights of this of 325B, a, a distribution agreement can be created without a written contract. That's different than a lot of other states. And what happens when I, when I meet with clients, I tell them, I don't, the, the first time I meet with them, I'm talking about forming their entity, doing their trademarks, finding real estate, doing their licensing, maybe raising money. And I have to, and I bring up, don't you dare give a drop of beer to a wholesaler without me touching a contract because you may have just created a distribution relationship that you can't get out of and you have no terms to it other than what the statute says, which spoiler alert, they aren't good for you. Um, the, the, st the statute says the brewery can only terminate the agreement for good cause. The good cause is defined by the statute and it's, you know, it's the, the wholesaler going out of business or losing their license or all there's language in there about um, breaching a material, like a, 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 breaching a clause of the a distribution agreement that has a material adverse effect on the brewery's business. So when I draft a distribution agreement and I always pride myself when I get a, the contract from the wholesaler, um, I always want to put more red on the page than black when I'm done. I think I've done my job if I do that. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit more fair, but um, I always put in, the, I put a whole bunch of obligations of the wholesaler, because of course there's nothing other than we just pick it up and drop it off and send you a check. That's about the only obligations the wholesaler wants to make. But I put in there about quality control and marketing initiatives and a lot of other things to make them uh, want to focus attention on my clients' uh, products. And I put a clause in and I said, the, you know, the parties acknowledge, the, the distributor acknowledges that a breach of any of these obligations would have a material and adverse effect on the brewery's business. Now, all I did was just take away a fact issue for the judge, but I don't, that's it, but I just have to, I, I'm still going to fight on whether or not there was a, there was a, you know, was a breach, whether or not, you know, all that. I just took away the issue of whether or not it meets good cause. You know, so we just fight over whether or not they breach the contract. Um, even if they do breach, the law requires that they have to provide the wholesaler with a 90 day written notice and the wholesaler has an opportunity to cure. So it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, wholesaler friendly statute. Um, and what 
Our local breweries want, and what 12 states have enacted, is a small brewer exemption, which what happens right now is if a brewery wants to leave their distributor and say sign with somebody else, here's how it works in practice. They have to they go talk to another wholesaler and maybe a wholesaler, a new wholesaler is interested. And then the brewery is out of it. The, whole, the new wholesaler has to go talk to old wholesaler about how much they would pay. They, they, they have to pay for the rights. So the brewery has no say in it. OK, if the brewery just wants to take them back and self-distribute, they usually have to pay some multiple, some sort of fair market valuation calculation rather than just buying back unsold inventory. So what these small brewer exemptions do that have been enacted is, and it, it depends on, the different states are different. So some of them may say, if you're, um, if, you're, if, if you're under so many barrels of production, this applies to you. Others may say, if you are under a certain percentage of the wholesaler's uh, sales revenues, then it applies. But regardless of what the threshold is, um, the, what, what allows to, a lot of these statutes allow is that the brewer, these small brewers, if they qualify, can buy back their inventory and get out of their distribution agreement, rather than just having this unwritten, these unwritten rules where you're basically at the whim of the wholesalers if you're the brewery. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if something like that is proposed next uh, next session here in Minnesota. I think that some of the some of the breweries are, are working to try to get something going. Um, to and, and it's going to be a huge fight. I mean, the wholesalers are going to scream bloody murder, and you know, they, they 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 do very well under the the way the current system is. And if you guys back to my little historical discussion before, this reason we have these three tiers is again, you know, everybody thinks the breweries were evil; they caused all this bad stuff that we had, so we had to ban alcohol in this country. But now we're going to make it legal again, but we're not going to let them have the tied houses and all the rights they had before. So we're going to stick this middleman in here. So you have to sell your beer to a to a middleman, and they in turn will sell it to the the bars and restaurants. So you can't go, you know, manipulate the bars and restaurants to you know to make them only sell your product because there may have been a few that that did stuff like that. Um, and so that's where we get this. They call it the three tier system. Uh, manufacturing, wholesale, retail. And then there's the whole bunch of rules behind the scenes as to you can't own an interest in two different tiers. So if I've got a brewery client and they want to take and someone wants someone who owns a bar wants to invest in them, they can't do it because they got a retail liquor license. That seemed to be a problem. Now, AGE says that they they treat the spouse as a separate person. So there's a lot of times where husband owns uh, bar and wife owns brewery. And I'm like, what's the point? But I've got a letter from them that that's their current position. So there's a there's a number of there's a number of couples around the state that have interest in bars and breweries because of because of this little this small little exception. Um, so that's where this this three tier system comes from. Um, I didn't even cover anything about saturation. Here's here's I'll give you my my take on on the saturation stuff, and then I'll take some questions too. Um, I think that when you answer the question about whether or not our market, particularly on the brewery side, has become saturated, my answer is yes and no. Um, yes, in that I you know there's two there's two there's two different models of brewery in this state. One is the production brewery, Surly, Summit, Shells, Liftbridge, Flat Earth, Fulton, Indeed, where they're, they've got a bottling line or a canning line. They're doing kegs. They're, do, they're selling to liquor stores. They're selling to bars and restaurants. They existed before there was the tap room law. They've added tap rooms. Um, maybe some of them have come out after the tap room law and have just grown to a size where they are going to distrib make distribution a big thrust of their business model. Um, I don't know that we're going to see too many more of those open up in Minnesota. I think we are at a point where we've, we've got, you look to go to liquor stores now, especially in the local section, they've run out of room. They have to build new liquor stores to contain all the local section. Um, funny little aside, I'll tell you, when I went, I went to a liquor store in Wisconsin one time, and they're serious about their beer over in Wisconsin. They had, there was an entire wall was all the Wisconsin products. So it was New Glarus and uh, Miller and every Lineys, everything Wisconsin. And then along the side of the wall was where I could find Summit 
and um, I think uh, Green Belt was there, and it was in with uh, Dogfish Head, Harp, Guinness, Corona, Red Stripe, under a sign that said World Beer. So if you were not from Wisconsin, you weren't even from America. Anyway, so that's back to this. So um, I think that we've reached the point, I don't know if we're going to see too many more large-scale production packaging breweries opening up in Minnesota. We're already seeing now, I mentioned before about the sale of distribution rights, we're seeing wholesalers that are, that they're just giving preference to the brands that they paid for and not giving, so the, the breweries that signed up with these wholesalers before this, at the advent of selling distribution rights, um, they're getting worse shelf space or wanting to get back, get their rights back because the wholesaler is not pushing them as much uh, as, as they used to. Hence why we want a small brewery exemption. In terms of what I call the dangerous man model, the, the tap room driven, um, not necessarily doing, uh, you know, case, uh, cans or, or bottles for liquor stores, but basically crawlers, growlers, an occasional 750 bottle release, um, a lot of pints and flights at the tap room. I think there's no limit to how many of those we can have. I mean, you see, I, I have clients all over the state that are forming that want to just have a little destination place. It's basically a glorified bar that makes their own beer. And everybody likes to have their, their little local brewery and have a little, a little destination brewery. So I think that that model can sustain itself all day and will continue to. Um, it's the ones, the, the ones that, that, that where you might see some consolidation are those that maybe bit off more they could, than they could chew in distribution and are going to, or maybe throw and some, and some other brewery in town is throwing a lifeline to them to get them out to, to, you know, to basically take them over by the, you know, by the equipment. Um, so I think we're going to still see growth there. I think that the distilleries, I think we're going to see some more growth. A big, this is going to be a big jumping off point here coming in a, this coming winter and spring um, where our local distilleries are, are going to have the, their first uh, whiskeys rolled up, rolled off. Some of them have put out whiskeys, but they've artificially aged them. The ones that did it the way that you typically would think of as aging whiskey, those are gonna like for example, my client is Tattersall. I think Tattersall is gonna have their whiskey out in February, so that's gonna be. And I, I can tell you that I, I might have sampled some of it a few months ago while it was in process. It's pretty damn good. Um, better compared to some of the stuff that's been art, aged artificially. Um, and, and then I think there's gonna be. A, I think the real growth market is gonna be in non-farm. Cideries. I think that there is a huge market for cider, um, in the, especially in its gluten-free form. You see a lot of breweries that are doing, you know, I said sociable is one of them, but I, I know of others, uh, clients of mine that do a malted cider. There's a market for it, and I think that we're going to continue to see that grow. I think I, I, there's going to be a few um, opening up here probably in the next year beyond just urban forage. And so I think that's going to be a big um I think we're going to see a lot, or some, see more growth in that market, and I think we might see um, some more law reforms. What, what, the, what the urban cideries want is parity with the farm with the farm wineries. So we want they, they're going to want the right to self distribute. So we'll see what happens. Like I said, the the wholesalers are a very well financed and well connected special interest group. So some of these distribution law reforms may take a number of sessions to get anywhere. Just like Sunday sales. Sunday sales took. I think since they really, I mean, they've, they've introduced it about every year, at least in my lifetime, but I think in the last five years was when they really put a strong push on to try to get it. And it took that long to to uh, to get enough critical mass to 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 change it. So we'll see where, you know, we'll see where, we'll see where it goes. I, I said before, I think that, you know, we're, we're looking at alcohol production differently from, from a instead of public safety more so towards economic development and tax revenue. I think as more, what I would say, craft-friendly legislators uh, end up over here. Um, and that, and that's, it's not a partisan issue, it's more of a, of a, a generational issue. Um, but I, th I think we're gonna see more willingness to change the laws to make it more friendly for our local uh, manufacturers of all, of all stripes. So um, it's it's gonna continue to be interesting. We're gonna be continue to see where the where the market goes, and um, it's it's a it's a fun area to be involved with. It's a little bit frustrating because you know most of the, you, should, you can't just go to a you know book and research whatever the you know this is, this code says this. I've got to go. You got, you got to make you got to be chummy with all the AGE agents so you can find out what how far you can push them. 
but um, you know, it's, 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 it's fun stuff. So um, any questions about anything? Yeah. Uh, what, if anything, are you hearing uh, about changes in state or federal alcohol tax rates? Um, um, could you just repeat the question for the folks? Sure. The, the question was what, any any proposed changes in state or federal alcohol tax rates, and that's a really good question. Um, it, it, remember, one thing is when it comes to taxes, the the manufacturers pay an excise tax at, at the federal level. And then depending on the sales, they also pay sales taxes. I know there was a push a couple of years ago to increase the state excise tax. And everybody, that was the one time where all three tiers were teamed up together on the same side. They hated the idea and, you know, lobbied, lobbied the legislature uh, vehemently to, and, and, and it didn't go forward. Um, I, I, I'm not, I thought I, that the Small Brew Act had been reintroduced in the, at the federal level. I know a lot of Minnesota uh, elected officials have typically signed on, particularly in the Senate, uh, Senator Klobuchar typically has signed on to that bill. And in the House, um, Representative Paulson has typically been a sponsor of that bill. Um, that's what they want to do is, is drop the, for, for smaller breweries, lower the excise tax um, on the first X number of barrels that they produce. Um, and so I, I'm, not, I, I'm not aware of, uh, there's about three different proposals that have always been floated around. I don't know since January if they've, been, if they've reintroduced any of them this time. But the, if they think there's, the Brewers Association nationally, I know, is still advocating, um, pushing, cutting the excise tax rates, the federal rates. When a brewery enters into an agreement how does the licensing work for using the brewery's trademarks, like if they're federally registered? And has a brewery ever challenged a relationship with a distributor not based on breach of contract but trademark? Um, that's a good question. The question is, what what's the what what happens with a brewery's trademarks when they enter into an, a, a, a contract with a distributor, and has there been any any dispute with it between a brewery and a distributor not involving? A, a breach of the contract, but say you know, a, a infringement of the trademarks. Um, when I when I do a, a distribution agreement, I, there's a limited license from the brewery to the distributor to use the trademarks, logos, words, whatever the marks are, in conjunction with marketing the products. Now, what I typically also uh, include is a requirement that any marketing collateral that the distributor would be putting together could not be used without the prior uh, approval of the brewery to make sure that the marks are being used in a, in a, in a or any kind of marketing campaign is being used in an appropriate way. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware of any dispute between the brewery, a brewery and a wholesaler simply over the trademarks. Obviously the, the brewery is in, is, is holding the, the wholesaler harmless that their marks don't infringe. Um, and so if the wholesaler got tagged into some sort of a lawsuit, the, you know, the brewery would have, likely have to indemnify. But I'm not, I'm not aware of a, of, a, of a dispute between them. Are you? No, I was just wondering if that was a way around the good cause argument, instead of saying that, you know, they're violating... Uh, gotcha. No, no. It's, if, if you look at the wording of the statute, and that's a good question. Joey has done a lot of research for me on brewery law stuff, so Joey knows more, probably knows as much about brewery law as I do, so... That's why I was asking if you knew something. I'm like, what did, what did you know? What did you hear? I, you know. Um, no, it, if you look at the wording of it, 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 it's really narrow in terms of what constitutes good cause. So even trademark infringement, there might be there might be dam there might be damage liability for a trademark infringement if the wholesaler did it, but it's not defined in the statute as as good cause. It's a little bit of a follow up question that for these local breweries, are they able to federally register their trademarks? I would think. Uh, yes, they are. Really? Yes. There, there, there are grounds to do it. I mean, a lot of them, there are some, I mean, like, it's, it's easier as case for some of the regional ones. Um, and I, it escapes me right now how, I, I don't do as much of the trademark stuff as some of the others, but um, yes, there is a, there is a, there's, there is a commerce clause argument. But what, I just did a, a CLE with a friend of mine from Winthrop on Monday over in Wisconsin. I should have taken better notes because she, she rattled it off right there. But yes, there is, there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a commerce clause argument for 
why a ta why like, like a tap room, how they're. Yeah, it would be a different. Yeah, it would be a different, it'd be a different class of goods. There, there is an argument. I know that. It's narrow, but yes, there is. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about if you've heard anything regarding the tap room restriction on only selling the alcohol that they brew on site. If there's any, I think there's any movement with that, like letting a, a brewery perhaps offer like a guest tap to a cidery. Yeah, you know that's a good question. I don't think I don't see it happening. Um, now, if you look at Wisconsin, Wisconsin allows it. You, you don't necessarily just have, you aren't limited to your own products, whereas, whereas here you are. Um, I think that if you, if, if the breweries pushed something like that, I think that the brew pubs would have a problem with it because, you know, the brew pubs, that's one of the advantage, the difference between a brew pub and a brewery, you know, a, a lot of folks think those the difference is that they can, they can sell food. Well, it's not. A, a brewery can, in their tap room can have a, a restaurant by, by statute. The difference between a brewery and a brew pub is a brew pub can have a full retail liquor license. So they can serve not only their own products, but other beers, other spirits, wine. The, the trade-off is they give up. They, they can't distribute. Besides doing growlers or 750s off-sale, they have no other off-sale distribution. They can't do kegs. They can't go to distribute to other bars. They can distribute to their own um, locations. So if like if if, uh, if 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 someone if a, if there was a, a common ownership had a brewery or a brew pub and three restaurants, they could distribute their beer amongst all four of those locations up to 3,500 barrels. So they have low low thresholds as to how much they can produce and where they can distribute it. So if the breweries all of a sudden wanted to be able to serve more other people, other breweries products or other or a cider or something like that, I think the brew pubs would raise holy hell because that's the one one of the few benefits they have to being a brew pub. There there aren't very many brew pubs opening anymore. Usually we're like I I represent Day Block. There's Free House. With, both of those are kind of located in close proximity to downtown. The reason they do it is because of the downtown entertainment district. They can stay open later than what a, a brewery could keep their tap room open for. And that's why the so that the, they're that's why they elected to be you know go through the brew pub model and give up basically give up distribution because they were going to make they they're going to make more revenue by basically staying open later downtown. So, are, are there any questions on chat? Yes, there's one. Um, a person is asking tap rooms off, often do not have food offerings above snacks, which are not always prepackaged. In my experience, what are the rules regarding food and breweries? Good question. What are the rules regarding food and breweries? Um, like I just said, the, the under the, the tap room law, you a, a brewery can operate a a a, a restaurant as part of their tap room. So they can have a, a kitchen and serve whatever. Uh, one example that I represent Urban Growler over here in St. Paul, they have a full food menu, okay? Surly, their, their, big, their big destination brewery has a full food menu. A lot of them just do the snacks, like the, the questioner alluded to. Um, the, there's, there's a couple reasons for it, that why, why they don't choose to take advantage of that op, that, op, that that option that's allowed by them the statute. Number one, uh, practically speaking, a lot of these these, these uh, businesses, the owners have experience. They started out as home brewers. Uh, they, they have experience in making beer. Um, they don't have experience in making food or running a, a restaurant or a kitchen. The few that do, like Urban Growler, uh, one of the owners, the co-owners, Jill, she had that that background, so it was it was an easy fit to, to take advantage of it because she knew how to run a she knew how to run a restaurant. Um, that's one reason, so they don't have the experience to do it. Number two, it adds another level of regulation. Besides having to deal with AGE and the Department of Agriculture on your on your production facility, now you have to deal with the Department of Health on the the kitchen and the food service. So that that's another another strike against it. And the third is just practically speaking, if, especially if you're gonna, if you're one of those breweries that, that wants to put beers on tap at another bar or restaurant, um, you don't want to be competition. So you don't want to have to, um, to you know, if, if you're if you're serving food and your own beer, bar, some other bars might view you as a competitor. We don't they don't want to be seen that way. So it, it it's been a nice marriage with all the food trucks in town. As long as you know, it's not too cold outside, people can you know go and get their food. Um, so they've just chosen to use that as the alternative rather than have to have the rather than to take advantage of the of having a, a restaurant. 
Do you ever see there being a like a third category of beer created from our current system? Right now we have big beer, which is Miller, Anheuser Busch, and we have craft beer. But if you talk to the owner of Sam Adams, he would probably tell you that he's really not craft beer anymore. He's not really big beer. He has a lot of problems going into bars trying to get a tap line there because they either want craft beer or they want Miller. And do you think, you know, like a Summit or Shells or even Surly might end up getting too big to really be craft, but not big enough to be a beer? It's a good question. The question is, is there, you know, the, 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 what what is craft beer? Um, because we've got, we've got, you know, what, everybody has different definitions of it. It's Summit Craft Beer, it's Shell's Craft Beer, it's Sam Adams. And there's a huge, this is a big political controversy at the Brewers Association level. And I think it was a big thing at the, at the Great American Beer Festival as to um, who was allowed to participate. They were actually, what they've done, the, the bigger issue ends up being the craft breweries that are acquired by AB InBev and whether or not they're considered craft. Now at GABF this year, those breweries weren't allowed to participate. Um, so I think, I, I think that, I, I don't know that there's, uh, 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 they're gonna see three different categories of craft beer. I think it's still us versus them and them being basically AB InBev at this point. Um, and so I think that, yeah, it's weird. Sam Adams and Summit, some of those that are, that are larger and national and regional, they, I mean, they, they technically are, they, I mean, they're different than, you know, the AB InBev, but they're certainly more, they're certainly, their production levels are a lot more similar to, you know, the larger facilities like that. But right now, no, it's, the, the, they're, but, but they, they have, they have started ruling out breweries that can, when, once you sell out to AB InBev, you sell out to AB InBev, and you're, you're, you're dead to the craft world, apparently. Which I think is, a, I think it's, I mean, and I, I think, and I've said this on, I've got a record saying this, there's, a, you know, there's, there's some other brands that get grief because they sell out to like Constellation brands or Heineken. I said there's a difference between selling out to a large, a large brewery or selling out to a large brewery such as AB InBev that pretty much has its stated goal of running the craft industry out of existence so they can continue their monopoly. So that's, you can't just say it's all bad because you sold out to a big brewery. Well, no. If, if they're still, if they're giving you capital and they're and you're allowing you autonomy and you're still making really good beer, that's one thing. It's it's when you when 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 AB InBev is scooping up breweries and playing shenanigans with distribution that the Justice Department is constantly looking into. That's where we have a problem. Yeah. So um, I wondered. If, I know that you work in Minnesota, not Wisconsin, but I do. Can you explain the spotted cow thing? Like, what's the deal with the spotted cow? You can only sell in Wisconsin. You can't sell it here. Does Minnesota have something similar? No. Well, here, okay. First of all, I, I, I am licensed in Wisconsin, so I've got a couple of Wisconsin clients, too. And so I, I, every time I dig into the Wisconsin alcohol laws, I just bang my head against my desk because I realize how less, how less restrictive they are than Minnesota. And I always say that, you know, you always – the way you understand the logic of liquor laws is figure out who paid for them. So the difference between Minnesota and Wisconsin is Minnesota, the wholesalers have all the money and pay for the laws to be written a certain way. In Wisconsin, Miller's there. So the breweries have a heck of a lot more rights because Miller pays for the law. So that's my, you get really cynical in this area of the law. <laughs> um, Spotted Cow, it's a brilliant marketing strategy. They choose not to distribute beyond Wisconsin. That is their conscious decision because one of their models has been drink indigenous. So they market themselves as only in Wisconsin. You can only get us in Wisconsin. And if you remember, I still don't know what the thinking was. I'm, I'm hoping for their sake that it was some sort of civil disobedience, but Maple Tavern in Maple Grove that went over to Casanova Liquors and bought a keg of spotted cow and brought it to their, their not only brings it to their bar in Maple Grove, but then puts the, the Nuglaris tap handle on it and takes a photo of it and puts it on their Facebook page and brags that they have it. Everybody that would care about Spotted Cow knows that that Spotted Cow doesn't distribute outside of Wisconsin. So that was a real quick violation, I, uh, I think, on, on AGE's part. That was not a hard one to assess. So I said, I'm hoping they were doing it some sort of protest about something or other, for what I don't know. But um, yeah, that's that's why you can only get New Glarus beers in Wisconsin, because they, they deliberately um, limit their distribution to Wisconsin. It's it's just a it's just their marketing thing. 
they could just they could easily come over here and 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 but now there are some there are some breweries that if, if, they, if they lay out for so long out of Minnesota, they can come back in with a different wholesaler. That was one of Doc, you know, Dogfish Head is now back in town out of Delaware. They had to lay out for like uh, you know, two years before they could come back in because of, they wanted to get out of their relationship with their with their importer. I just, I don't want to hog all the questions. Um, did anyone else have a question? All right. Um, do you think that the situation that we're at now with the small tap rooms, kind of the community tap room, is similar to the kind of the pre-prohibition era where every small town had its yep. own little brewery? That's a really good question. Yes, I do think that what we're seeing now. Now, remember, it's funny that if you look at there's a great book by a, a guy by the name of Doug Hoverson called Land of Amber Waters, and it goes through. Now, this is current through I think 2007 or eight. So this is pre tap room. You know, breweries exploding in Minnesota, but it's a really good historical look back at all the breweries that have been in Minnesota since the beginning of statehood. And yet, back back in the day, um, particularly we, we, you know when everything was shipped by rail or refrigeration wasn't that great, every town had their own brewery. Um, you know, as you know, because th that's the way you had fresh beer. Um, it's interesting. Some of the some of those old breweries have been. Um, you know, have been repurposed as part of the Montgomery Brewing is one of them that that's that's they just revived their their old brands. Um, you know, new people doing it. Um, so, yeah, I do think that I mean, every city now seems to want to have one. It's funny where I live out in the far northwestern suburbs, I'm way out in Albert. Well, I guess I said we're only considered a suburb because we have the outlet mall and everybody in the suburbs comes out there. But you get past there and I remember a client of mine that's now located in Buffalo, and he had um, originally gone to Monticello, and Monticello didn't want anything to do with this. And then Lupulin opened up in Big Lake, and the, the, com the competition between these small towns when you get further out is incredible because all of a sudden I'm being called by the Elk River people to ask to help write a growler ordinance, and now Monticello is getting two breweries. And every you know, river's getting a brewery, and everybody wants a brewery now out there because it, oh my God, Big Lake got one. So it's it, it's just crazy the competition that with these little communities. It's, one gets them, and it's just like boom, which I love because that for the outstate breweries, that's great to have a number of breweries in the area. You talk about people doing the winery tours, like say down by Lake Lake Pappen, um, to have like a, a basically a, a path that you can follow with all the, the breweries in a certain area, that's going to be more impetus to uh, go out there as opposed to, you know, you can't, not all of us can roll across Northeast uh, on, on every single day and hit all those breweries. we got to give some business to the ones out state too. So it's, I love seeing them in a little cluster like that, or at least a line so you can do a little, you know, kind of a day trip brewery tour thing. Anything else? Anything in chat? Okay. All right. I think we made it to our hour, so we're good. You can claim your credit. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.